drip, you know, dip or it's, it's, good morning. Oh, I'm having problems with this phone right now. For some reason, my little stand doesn't want to sit straight. So I apologize for that. Good morning. Okay, this is not going to be good right now. Uh, sorry, guys. I should have set this up earlier, and I did have it set up, and then now it's... Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. That's 30 minutes of nonstop teaching, and today we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you want to grab your, your Bible... Uh, we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And we do a simple expositorial teaching on the Word of God. If you're ever in the neighborhood driving your kids to school, now that summer's off, come out, join us in some fellowship and some prayer at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. So let's grab our Bibles, highlighters, and pins, and let's see what the Lord has to say to us today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we, <clears throat> we come before you, Lord, and just to start this uh, new week, Father, we give you thanks to getting us through the weekend for the blessings of your word on Sunday, the worship, the fellowship, Lord, uh, even the rain, Lord. Uh, it was all a challenge, but Lord, you got us through it. And Lord, I, I personally like times like that because it really does show us our own hearts and uh, the efforts that we put towards the things that we do, Lord. And that we fed so many families on Sunday, Lord. And so, Lord, it was a blessing to be used by you, Father. And now, Lord, we begin a new week. Prepare our hearts for the week, Lord. <coughs> Give us strength. <coughs> Direct us, lead us. <coughs> and, Lord, number our steps, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, D. D. T. Nelson Montero. <clears throat> All right, let's start as Paul concludes uh, his second uh, letter to the Corinthian church. And apparently there must have been a third letter, as many commentators will say. We really don't know what that consisted of uh, because we don't have it. Otherwise, it'd be in the Word, so it got lost somewhere or it was destroyed. Or, as some others have suggested, that it's possible that <clears throat> the third letter is within the first and second letter. And the divisions, when they made them up, uh, didn't uh, go well. And so could be that we have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd here in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. As you know, <clears throat> God didn't put titles on the Word, nor did He put uh, little subtitles over the outline of the Word, nor did He put even the little verses over the Word. It was just the Word of God in a scroll form all the way through. And later on... Uh, the church came along and they divided it so that it's easier to quote, easier to get to, reference. Uh, it's just so much more uh, friendly to the reader. So that's why we have the chapters, that's why we have the verses and, and so forth. So this is a short chapter, not a whole lot here, but yet it's a powerful ending on Paul's behalf. And you always want a powerful ending when you're writing a letter, right? Usually letters are, are introductions and then you have the main point and then you say your goodbyes. So here, Paul is, is basically saying his goodbyes, but he says it with, with some power. And that's a good way to end a message, is always with, with power. Uh, I recently <clears throat> read that it was A.W. Tozer, or I'm sorry, I think it was Warren Wisby, who passed away recently, said that every message should always end with the gospel message. Because you should be able to preach that gospel message to every Sunday service. Uh, so that they hear the gospel message. And he says a church that is growing is one that is preaching the gospel message every Sunday. And so I've decided that I'm going to somehow incorporate at the end of each message the gospel message. I don't know if you've noticed that lately, that now I'm sharing the gospel because according to him, and I would agree, uh, people don't know what it means to be saved and they don't understand the fact that you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. And so he, have, he has found that new believers will, will uh, receive Christ, but people who say they're believers will also receive Christ in a new way because they have better understanding what it means. 
And so the church will really begin to grow in that manner because when they truly are saved, guys, and I know all of you here are sitting here and you're here because you are saved. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. There is a natural desire to hear God's word, to take time to serve him, to get involved. That's true salvation. I, I really believe that a person that's saved cannot help themselves but to help and get involved. Even, even if their lives are very busy, they will begin to <clears throat> bring Christ in the center of that and they'll eliminate things that are not as important. Um, one thing I know with young families is sports. They feel that sports for their children is very important and that they should be in sports. But when sports takes over church and, and church <coughs> functions, that's when I totally disagree. If you are thinking that sports are gonna teach your children good social skills, if, teach them uh, how to be leaders, you're wrong because the sports is not gonna do it. Uh, when you are out there on the field with some of these sports uh, fanatics and teachers, they're not very good examples of what people uh, should be behaving like in the sports. They're not lifting up Christ. It's all about self. <clears throat> uh, and it's not productive. I really don't believe that. But again, I think that if you have a well-rounded life and putting Christ first, then other things come in place and it works out a lot better. And I think you'll see uh, a child grow so much more closer to the Lord than not. So let's go ahead and close up this book. It's in verse one of chapter 13. This will be the third time I am coming to you. So apparently, uh, Paul has come to the Corinthians twice, and this is now going to be the third time. Now, as you know, we're going through Corinthians on Sunday mornings, and we're seeing some of the uh, the carnality of the church, right? Yeah. I mean, just the first first four chapters was dealing with their their uh, divisions and their choosing and dividing of 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 teachers and, and their arrogance in that all, as though one teacher is better than another. And then we get right into chapter five, six, and seven, and they're dealing with the sexual immorality within the church itself, you know? So it's like, where is the good stuff coming? Where are the attaboys? And not a whole lot of that. Um, their willingness to change was there, but Paul is definitely encouraging them to do that. And he does here in this uh, chapter here in Second Corinthians. So third time now, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, uh, every word shall be established. Now that is a, a quote uh, from the Old Testament and it is dealing, it's, it's a legal quote and basically what it's saying and we've kind of uh, uh, mimicked our laws according to the biblical principles that we find in the Old Testament. Our country <clears throat> has created these laws and one of the laws is there has to be some witnesses, right? <clears throat> you can't just say something happened <clears throat> and you can't say I heard something happen because that's hearsay. There has to literally be two witnesses to settle a situation. <clears throat> so what he's saying here in the situations that he's dealing with, there are two or three witnesses that are there and the word will be established. In other words, you can, you can trust that word that there's truth to that because you have more than one person saying it. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time, and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before, and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare. Now we saw in 1 Corinthians that Paul said, I'm gonna to come to you, I can come to you, and I think it's chapter four, I can come to you with a rod, or I can come to you in gentleness. It's up to you and how I come. Now, I would rather them come in gentleness and, and correcting me rather than with the, with the rod. <clears throat> but both those, both those ways do work, by the way. I don't, I don't think that one is good over the other. It just all depends on the situation. I would think that you would want someone to come in gentleness, though, more than the rod. But I've had people come with a rod forcefully um, and with the intent to correct forcefully, and I've received that because I get where they're coming from um, and the situation, and so they're, they're really passionate about what they believe, and they're trying to make that point, and sometimes it comes off very, very harsh, but I get the point, and that's what you really have to look at, you know, is 
the point. What are they saying? And if what they're saying is true, then you need to accept that. Now, I've seen people come up very gently, and they say it very gently with all the right adjectives, you know, behind it. I love you. I care about you. You know, I just want to see us working together. There's so much. And there's, there's a good thing about that, too. But then what's the point? Because if you have no point, it's just all wishy-washy, watered-down tolerance, you know, then there's no point, then that's not going to work either. So there has to be a, a balance there. And so Paul again here is saying, look, I'm sparing you. <laughs> I could have come again with a rod, but again, I'd rather not. He says, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. So apparently the Corinthians still were doubting Paul's authority as an apostle, and some of them were desiring some sort of proof that Christ was using him and called him in, in a uh, divine way. And so Paul was not defending that again, and I don't think Paul defends himself, he just shares the truth of what's happening, and so he just tells it like it is, and not necessarily, because he doesn't have to defend himself. He doesn't have to defend what God has done in his life, it's interesting because we can stand outside of someone and look at them and look at their fruit and we can make a decision, say, well, they're anointed of the Lord or they're not anointed of the Lord. Now, usually someone that's just sitting there and doing nothing in and out, you would say they're probably not anointed by the Lord. They're really not doing anything for the Lord. And so they know the Lord. They have a relationship with the Lord, I'm sure. We don't know what's going on at home, but they're definitely not doing anything within the church that you see some anointing upon them. So you can make that judgment call in what you see in inspecting their life. And then you see someone else and you see them working and serving and you're seeing fruit coming forth. People are getting saved or people are ministered to, people are comforted by them. And you see that there's an anointing there. Uh, yet, you don't need to take offense to the fact that someone's questioning your salvation because you should know it more than anyone else, right? Uh, the Apostle Paul could literally say, you weren't there when God blinded me, when I was on the road to kill Christians. You weren't there when he spoke to my ear and I heard him and said, yes, Lord, and then my life changed. You weren't there when I spent all that time in the wilderness seeking the Lord for direction. And you weren't there when I went to the apostles. And at first they were hesitant because they thought that I was setting a trap for them. But eventually through Barnabas and others, they received me, and then we saw the Gentiles coming to the Lord, and there was an anointing on their lap. You weren't there. And Paul could have went through all of that testimony, but he didn't need to. You know, so they may be questioning whether he's of God or not, but the fact is Paul knows he's of God. And we all should have a sense of our own salvation and, and what God has called us to do. I know there's been times in my life where even pastors have said, no, he's not called of God. You know, because of this or that, or even people within the church, because they don't like the way that I teach, or the style, or the bluntness of my teaching, because I don't know any other way but to be blunt and honest and very simple. I just got a comment from someone, uh, and they said, I love the way you just, you dissect each verse, and you stick with the text, and you just go on. I go, yeah, that's because I'm not very smart. <laughs> yeah. But they like that, where other pastors are very flowery, you know, and, and they go off on tangents and talk about a specific subject and so forth. And I get that. There's a, there's a need for that. Definitely in Apollo, you know, or Cephas or, or, or Paul here. But I like doing that. I like just sticking with the word because that's what we're here to learn, right? Is the yeah. word and nothing else. And so I would rather just teach the word simply than not. But those people, they'll come up and, and they'll say, you know, uh, I don't think you're anointed of the Lord. But then I look back at my life and I see what happened in my life. They weren't there when God called me. I mean, I didn't desire to be in the ministry. It wasn't something that, that I was looking forward to and hoping in and thinking, you know, one day I'll be a pastor. But it was totally the opposite. I didn't want to. But then God began to use me where my pastor got sick. And so now I find myself in a situation where I've got to help out and I've got to run the church for eight months, and God gave me that opportunity to learn the insides of a church and how it functions. Not just the teaching, but there's so much more to it that people don't understand. And so people aren't there when, they, when I went through all of that, and I saw God's calling, and one by, 
by dragging more than anything else because I was like a Jonah. Lord, I don't want to do this. You know, I have a great job. I don't need to do this. But yet God called me to do it. I remember a situation that arose and I didn't want to deal with it. I thought that was between them and the pastor. And so I was trying to stay out of it. And God says, you're a shepherd just as much as the pastor is. And though you're an assistant pastor, you're still a shepherd to my people. And I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you. <laughs> I've got to get involved. And I did. Of course, it didn't go well, but that's the calling that I have, you know. So Paul here is saying, look, you guys want some evidence um, of my apostleship. And then he goes on, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Now, again, he says the evidence is in the power of God. And ultimately, it has to be in the power of God. And, and our ability comes from God, and the fruit is from God, and it's not from us or our flesh. And then he goes on, and he says this great profound thing, and I love this chapter because of this. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? I love this this little verse here. There's so much here. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith or not. That's the first step that every one of us should be examining, our own selves, not someone else. And that word examine means put yourself under a microscope. I don't know if you remember in school when you had to dissect a frog. I remember those days when they, they had us dissect frogs and then put the tissue under a microscope. And a microscope does what? It amplifies, depends on, on the amplification, whether it's a thousand, you know, or 500, you see the tissue, you see within the tissue, then you start seeing cells within the blood itself. Uh, that's the word that Paul uses here. You need to examine yourself. You need to get that magnifying glass and stand under it and put it up to about 10,000 times and see where your heart really is. But see, immediately we get offensive and immediately we, we start pointing fingers. We, get, uh, we begin to get rational. And, and, and I remember just talking with someone uh, recently and, and, and they were going through something and, and they said, yeah, and even so-and-so agreed with me. And I said, you'd like that, right? Because they agreed with you. Well, yeah. <laughs> I go, well, just because they agree doesn't mean that you're right. <laughs> And you have to even be careful of that. Just because you have people agreeing with you doesn't mean you're right. So you have to examine yourself in light of the scriptures and, and see whether you're in the faith or not. Are you in the faith? Are you acting like a child? Are you loving more others than yourself? Are you sacrificing? Are you taking the hurt? Those are all biblical truths. You know, if obviously they're coming against God, then are you standing up for Christ? Are you sharing the gospel for Christ? So examine yourself. And it, he uses the word prove yourself. And, and that word prove is under pressure. You know, proving yourself in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the situation, you prove yourself that you are on the right side. Uh, do you not know yourselves? Know yourself. Know your weaknesses. Know your flaws. Know your strengths. Know who you are in Christ. Uh, those are areas that you, sh you need to know. Um, I was just sharing with uh, my brother, David Zamora. We were on the phone for a couple of hours, it seems like. And um, he had a hard message he gave yesterday. And I told him, yeah, my message was pretty hard too. I didn't even share half of what I probably should have shared. But that message was hard. You know, the, the Corinthian church dealing with someone sitting in the church and that sexual immorality, because that's an area that, that has been a struggle for me. I mean, when you have a child at 15, 16 years of age, you know, you know you've got some issues there, you know, without the Lord, uh, you know, let alone. But uh, yeah, that's always been an issue. So it's a, a hard thing. He goes, yeah, sometimes as pastors, you know, we've got to give messages when we're dealing with things. Yeah, but we're called to set ourselves aside and preach the truth, you know, and some of those messages can be very, very hard. So we need to know ourselves know our flaws, know our, our weaknesses. And of course, Paul said in our weaknesses, God can be strong, you know? Yes. Uh, know that you have limitations. I am a doer. And so I would literally 
not ask anyone to do anything. I just do it myself. But with my back and the struggles I have, I can't do that anymore. So now I'm like calling on people. Can you do all do that? And sometimes I feel like I'm just standing around. Can you just go get that for me? And I feel bad because it's like I should be able to get that myself. But I have to know my limitations because I get hurt every, it seems like every two, three months, all of a sudden my back kicks up. And there I am again crippled for three weeks. And then again, I feel better and I go and do something and boom, I'm, I'm learning where my limits are still in that area. But we need to know ourselves. And why is this all important? Because we're supposed to have a balanced life in Christ. I'm not saying let people walk all over you. Okay, I'm not saying that. And I know it may sound like that. What I'm saying is learn to think of yourself less. Now that's true humility. It's not that you let people walk all over you, but you just don't think of yourself. You think of others. And then you let them be. Let God deal with them and their, their issues. <clears throat> he goes on, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now, I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And so, again, part of Paul's qualification is the fact that he teaches truth. He doesn't vary from it. And so you do what you think is right, but we're going to do nothing but the truth because there's nothing else but that truth, right? Peter understood that when many of the disciples left Jesus and Jesus asked him, and now you have to know yourself at this point, right? Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, are you going to leave me too? And you have to know yourself at that point. And Peter realized, I don't know much. You know, I don't know a whole lot of doctrine. I don't know a whole lot of this new way. I don't know really a whole lot. And so he looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, where am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Now that's humility, right? That's humility. Uh, that's not pride. That's saying I have an area that I'm weak in. And that area is the knowledge of who you are and eternal salvation. And so why would I leave? I want to understand this more because of that weakness. And by the way, if you have a good leader, uh, he will understand the, the, the fact that you may not know everything. He'll understand that you're not perfect. He'll understand <clears throat> that you're growing. He'll understand all those things. Just as much as you need to understand that as a leader, he needs to get things done. And things need to get done and be done in orderly and so forth. So it's working together as we know each other. <clears throat> but it's for the truth, right? Yes. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. Therefore, I write these things being absent, at least being present, I should use sharp. Uh, the word sharp there means abrupt or courtly, you know, quick, sharpness in a, in a sense. You ever do, do things like that where you're just sharp, you know? <clears throat> where all of a sudden your kids are doing something, and you ask them, hey, could you go do this? And they're still sitting there doing nothing. And you go, get up now and do it. That's sharp. I've already asked you three times, go. That's being sharp. Obviously, the person is not listening, and so you're sharp. And again, he goes, I'd rather come to you again in mercies than being sharp according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. So that balance again. Does Paul have authority? Yes. Does a minister have authority? Yes. <clears throat> He's responsible for the ministry that God has given to him to be an overseer or a steward of. And so there's a certain amount of authority, but at that authority should not lead to destruction, but to edification. So it has to be used to encourage and strengthen the believers and not to destroy them. And that takes a balance. And it takes some wisdom and definitely a lot of praying. Finally, brother, and farewell. So now Paul's like, okay, now I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, become or become uh, complete. I like that short little statement. Become complete, guys. What is he saying there? There's so much that he's implying by that, right? Become complete. That means we're incomplete. There's a lot of flaws. So work on those areas. <laughs> We don't fully love God. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You're incomplete there. So work on that. Look at going to church on the Sabbath. You might be incomplete there. Work on going to church on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings. Work on that. You're not 
complete in that area. You know, using the Lord's name in vain, respecting the Lord's name, work on that. So we're not complete. So become complete. Uh, work on that in prayer, in fasting, and seeking uh, the Lord. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So those are some good, good uh, words right there of encouragement. You know, comfort yourselves. Be of one mind or in one life and, and be in peace. And then God will grant the rest to us. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The Holy Spirit. There we see the Trinity, right? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Ah, that's, awesome. that's three in one right there. You have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. And the Bible teaches that they're all God. I know that's confusing to some of us, but the Bible teaches that these three are one as God in nature. Now, I don't know if anybody can explain that, Being God in, in essence, the Father is God, and we don't see the Father. He is God in, in his fullness. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Son, who I believe in the beginning was <clears throat> with the Father and the Holy Spirit in its fullness, and you couldn't see the God. If you were to go back before all of creation, God just existed. Whether it was like a burning bush, you didn't, he had no form, but he existed and always existed. And then God came into the womb of a woman, Mary, and brought forth his son, Christ, in the form of a man. So now we have a picture of his son, Christ, as a man because he was born into this world. Pre that, he wasn't. Now we see Jesus. We don't, still don't see the Father and we still don't see the Holy Spirit. They have no real form. Our souls don't have form, right? These bodies are our form. This is what, this is what I look... This is what my tent looks like, mm -hmm. you know? If I'm a Coleman tent, I'll be green, you know? And it just houses someone inside. If you're, if you're one of these other REV tents, then you're all multicolored, <laughs> you know? But it's what's in the tent that matters. And our souls are in these tents. And when these tents die, goes back to dirt and dust, our souls go to heaven. In essence, that's who we are, right? Yes. That's who God is. That's who, and then we have a picture of Jesus like us in a body. When he died... His body died, but then he resurrected in a new body. And Jesus now lives in that body forever. Think of this. I don't know how much time we've got. I can't see. I've got to turn that light on next time. Okay, but think of this real quickly. Just your thought for the day. Here's your thought for the day. Think about this. How much Jesus has given up for you? Because he separated himself from the Father and became a man. That was a, That's a cost right there. That's a cost. That's how much he loved us, so... Thank you for viewing Devo 30 with us. Please share this Devo on your Facebook. You never know who might be ministered by this word here that God has written. We love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Have a wonderful day.